Hello and welcome everyone to this fascinating presentation, Finding Your Resources About the History of a House. This is the third webinar of a four-part series presented by the Museums of History New South Wales and the State Library of New South Wales. My name is Lucy. I am your host and a librarian at the State Library. Today, I will introduce you to our presenters, Jenny from the Museums of History and Andrew from the State Library. The Museums of History New South Wales and the State Library of New South Wales acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waters across New South Wales. We pay our respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and future and, ex and extend that respect to other First Nations people. Before we begin, if you would like to ask a question, then you may use the Q&A button throughout the webinar at the end of the session, our presenters will do their best to answer as many of your questions live. I will hand over now to Jenny from Museums of History, who will take you through the first part of the presentation. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Lucy, and I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm coming to you today from Darug country, and I'm going to talk to you about using the collections of the Museum of History New South Wales for house history. So basically we're going to cover um, what the State Collect Archives Collection is, a very brief history of the regulation of building, local government records and how they help, valuation cards and rolls from the Valuer General, the detailed sheets and field books created by the water boards, crown plans, particularly street alignment maps and road maps, deceased estate files. We're also going to look at the Caroline Simpson collection with its beautiful trade catalogues and wallpaper samples. So what is the State Archives Collection? Well, these are the records created as a result of the activities of the New South Wales government and its agencies and departments. And these records are selected and preserved because they document the policy and decisions of the state government. And they're kept forever as state archives. And there's three key questions you really need to ask yourself about uh, our records before you use them for your topic. The first is the obvious one, which is what role did the state government play in your research topic? Did they create any records when they created policy and decisions? And importantly, did those records survive until 1961? Because the Archives Act of 1960 is when we are established and you can check our catalogue under the name of the agency to see what records they have stored with us, they have transferred to us. One prime example of material that didn't survive, of course, is the principal superintendent of convicts records, which were destroyed in the 1860s and the 1870s. Also remember that the majority of the records are not digitised, they're all originals, and so they can only be viewed at the State Archives reading room out here at Kingswood. Now, in terms of building, the state government certainly has a role to play in land. So the surveying of land, the alienation from the Crown, and then sub subsequent mortgages resale to others. So we do certainly have lots of records about land surveying and land sales. But in terms of buildings, it's really the local government that was in control of the regulation of building, with a couple of exceptions. And local government records only came under state archives under the State Records Act of 1998. So whilst we do have some, it's quite possible that the records are still with the council that created them. The exceptions to building are hotels. So we have lots of hotel plans because the state wanted to control the liquor industry. We have theatre and public halls because the state licensed theatres and there was also the question of fire and public safety. And we have tall buildings. The Height of Buildings Act came into Sydney in 1912 and in the 1950s was extended to Newcastle. And here we see some examples of why somebody might like to control building so that it doesn't actually fall down. There's two themes in the control of buildings, um, sorry, three themes. The first two is basically, and it seems rather straightforward, but they don't want people building on footpaths and roads. And this, seems to be something that we take for granted, but it didn't always happen. And the second theme is fire prevention. 
So in 1810, 1827 and 1834, there were acts by the state government to stop people, or I should say the colonial government, to stop people building on roads and footpaths. And this applied mainly in the area now known as the city of Sydney, but also in 1810, there were laws for either types of dwellings to be built in the Macquarie towns, Windsor, Richmond, Wilberforce, Castlereagh, Pitt Town. This was later extended to Hobart, Liverpool and Campbelltown. The 1837 Sydney Building Act was about fire prevention, concepts that I think we take for granted, like having party walls between buildings so that types of materials that buildings could be built of. And that was extended in the 1840s to other capital areas, other areas that are now capitals, I should say. 1842, you actually get local government in the city of Sydney. 1879, the City of Sydney Improvement Act, and that's where they talk about the classification of buildings and the regulation of new buildings. 1896 is a third theme, which is basically public health and preventing disease. And part five of this act did cover building areas and buildings. Now, Local government, again, is one of those things we tend to think has been with us forever, but in fact, it wasn't. It's not till 1905, 1906, that two thirds of the state actually gets local government. Before that, and this is basically the Eastern and Central areas, before that, um, there were little pockets, municipalities, boroughs, but it was not compulsory. And in fact, the way to get local government for your area was to take up a petition to the government to say, we want to have local government. But if somebody else could get up at a petition with more names than yours, it could all get defeated. Now, why would people not want local government at the time? Because local government's going to do things like build roads and bridges and garbage and all the sorts of things we take for granted nowadays. But basically, if you had local government, you were a ratepayer, you had to pay for these things. Whereas if you didn't have local government, you could ask the state government for money to build your roads and bridges. So the 1905-1906 acts are about the government getting sick of paying for things that they want the ratepayers to pay for. Now, shires are only established by the 1905 Act. So in fact, if your area was a shire, there is no local government before that at all. And the shires didn't actually have to do all that the municipalities did. They only had a limited there was a recognition that they didn't have the money or the population to do more, so there was a limited things that they could do. So in terms of building, it's not till Ordinance Number 70 comes in in 1909 that there's any regulation of building or subdivision. And 1913, you've got Ordinance 70A. Now, I wanted to have a look at the City of Sydney Archives website to see whether or not they had good plans of buildings, good runs of building plans in their series and in fact their building plans start in 1909 as well because that's when council decided that people applying to build had to send in two copies of the plans one to be kept by council and one to be handed back and ordinance 70 doesn't seem to have been mandatory for the shires because in 1916 tara shire newcastle is finally deciding to adopt it and that's seven years after supposedly it came in. But by 1919, all local government areas must do regulate their building in their area. And what I find even more interesting is that 1919 is the first time that you get the concept of actually separating out residential areas from industrial areas. Um, before that, you could build your nice house and somebody would come along right next door and build a, a tannery or a piggery or a slaughter yard next to it. So what records were created about building but by local government? Well, one of the first things, of course, is your minutes. And they are often the oldest. And often they will have references to letters to and from people who are building. This one's from Marrickville. And again, by 1914, people are still building on footpaths when they shouldn't be. You've got the building application and registers. Unfortunately, the applications do not always survive, but you might actually get a register from your local area. This one is Marrickville and it dates to 1922. Basically limited information about the house. 
and you've got rate books and valuation records. Now, the rate book is basically about the payment of money, the payment of the rates, very limited information on the house itself, but at least does tell you that there was a cottage in that locality at that time. So the valuation books are the ones that actually provide more information about the building itself. So we're moving on now to the valuer generals, valuation cards and valuation roles. Basically, before the 1916 Act, the government did not value land. It was all done by the local areas. And there was a problem because of the fact that they were one area would value land on one side of the road at a much higher level than land on the other side of the road by a different council. So there was this lack of consistency. So the valuation cards of the Valuer Journal are arranged by local government area. And unfortunately, after the 1973 Act, they don't include the kind of information that we want for house history, such as the value of the improvements and the information about the improvements. What they do tell you is the owner's name, plus any change of names. There's no information on the tenants unless they're the ones that pay the rates. Tell you the valuation area, the local government area, the land department description, such as county, parish, portion, section, the location of the land, the valuation dates, and what we're particularly after is the nature of improvements, and also they give you a value. And the important thing to remember is if the form says the unimproved value is equal to the improved value, then there are no improvements. So in fact, that is vacant land. So here we have some examples that are actually the property that I'm standing on at the moment. And this is the 1926 to 2029 St. Mary's cards. And you'll notice that it's 240 acres down the bottom in purple, a brick cottage, five rooms, kitchen, iron roof, barn, iron sheds, iron roof. So we get a good description of what's on that property, but it is a very big property. By 1932, it shrunk down to 180 acres but the brick cottage is still part of this record. And you'll notice you've got no street numbers uh, and we've got no certificate of title references, which is unfortunate. By 1935, it's shrunk down to 145 acres and something interesting has happened. We no longer have the brick cottage. So the brick cottage must have been on lot 36. So we've got sheds, bales, a silo, a milk room, a vineyard, clearing and fences. And by 1938, they've built a double-fronted wooden fibro cottage, three rooms, kitchen, and an iron roof. And then we have the subsequent subdivision of that 145 acres into 36 acre lots. And we're lot one, which by this time in 1969 is a slaughterhouse. So if we decide to go for a heritage look on our property, I'm voting for the vineyard, not the slaughterhouse. Now, just to show that it's not just Newcastle, Sydney, Wollongong, they did value these first from the 1920s, but they also valued some areas in the north and the south. So Tweed, records for Tweed start in 1921, records for Byron, Juni and Nowra start in 1922, and Broken Hill, they don't get to Broken Hill to the 1980s. So depends on when the act was applied to your locality as to whether or not we'll have records. So here we have the records for Roseneath, which is Lady 38 Boyd Road, Coulomb, which is now Tweed Heads, which is a reminder about the fact that streets can change name, streets can be renumbered or have no numbers or use house names, and locations can change names. So Coulomb has obviously become Tweed Heads. So here is the earliest card, which shows that the weatherboard dwelling with six rooms is on there in December 1921. And here we have the 1927 to 1935 record, which shows us that the iron work job has actually gone. And here we have the record that shows us the house was still there in 65. I did Google it, but unfortunately it's no longer there. So these, now we're moving on onto the detail sheets for sewerage. And basically before Sydney Water and Hunter Water put sewers through an area, they would map the area to see where the connections needed to be. And you get some fantastic records of footprints of houses. But even for Sydney, it's the area east of Parramatta and including Parramatta. It's not 
doesn't cover the Penrith area, for example. So here's an example of a sheet from Parramatta, and as you can see, very detailed, showing um, the houses, the outhouses. And if we just zoom into that record, you'll get a better idea of what it's showing. So we've got house names, we've got building materials, W for wood, B for brick, V for veranda. We've got the fences. We've even got what the fences are made of. And if there are drains or wells, they're marked as well. And this area is, again, these houses aren't here anymore. It's now a medical and dental center. The detailed sheets for Hunter Water Board are with at Newcastle Region Public Library. So please contact them before you go to talk to them about it. But down here at um, the State Archives Reading Room, we have the detailed sheet field books. And this is the book the surveyor took out with them when they went to create the original record. So as well as having the outlines of the buildings and what they're made of, you get all the measurements and surveyors love these things because they're constantly rechecking. Another type of plan, which surveyors also love, are the road, the street alignments and the road maps. Now these are crown plans. You can certainly come out here to Kingswood to look at these, they've been digitized, but they're only available to purchase from the information brokers that are listed on the New South Wales Land Registry Services. So copies only from them. And you can't see them on the Historic Land Record Viewer. Uh, you can only come out to Kingswood to the State Archives Reading Room and look at those. I'm not ever, I can't make up my mind actually as to whether or not it shows all the buildings in the town when the streets are aligned or whether in fact it only shows the ones that are close to the road. But it does show buildings and most Crown plans don't. And you get the number by looking at the parish maps and you'll see the numbers running alongside the edges of the road. And here we have an example of a road map between Maclay and Bellingen Rivers, 1867. And if we zoom in again on that, you'll see that it actually shows that the road is going to come too close, or rather a, a change to the road in blue is going to come too close to Baldwin's old house. It doesn't show us whether there's a new house or not. And by the next map, which is 1884, the house is not mentioned at all. So we'll go on to the fun one now, which is the deceased estate files. And these came about because the government would charge the estate of the person a percentage of the value of the estate. So they include information on what they owned, but they have to have owned it when they die. And they don't necessarily have to have lived in New South Wales. Um, the famous one is Rudyard Kipling. He has owned shares in New South Wales, so we have a deceased estate file for him. But they do include details, very precise details after 1920 of exactly what the person owned, including lists of house contents. There's none of them after 1981, and the ones from the 60s and 70s, you'll find the same information in the probate packets. You can purchase copies of them via the entries on our catalogue. So here we have one of those early ones where you get told that the person has 320 acres of land at Cobra, money and household furniture and a dray worth 150 pounds. But in fact, there's very little detail for this one for Thomas Giles, who died in 1882. Whereas for Arthur Harold Love of Vaucluse, who died in 1956, we get much more detailed information. So, for example, you get a certificate of valuation giving you the kind of details we saw on the Valuer General's records, including lot, um, the description of the house, two-storey house, nine rooms, kitchen and offices, tile roof, brick garage, tile roof. And we get a detailed list of the household furniture, quite descriptive with the amounts Jacobean brown oak circular table, three pounds. Jacobean brown oak tall palms bed stand, two pounds ten. I can't quite understand why the small library of books of a hundred volumes is only worth five pounds in total, whereas the chintz window curtains with rods are two pounds ten. 
Now, I know you're thinking, oh, that's because he lived in Vaucluse. That's why you've got such a lovely list. No, I've seen lists for people who are living in much poorer areas, and it tells you the number of teaspoons they have. Now, if the stamp duty office thought you were hiding assets, questions were asked. So this is Francis Scaling Lowe's of Tweed Head, who died in 1942. The interesting thing is that his furniture is only valued at £19. And when we actually look at the list, the itemised list, it's a case of stuffed birds, which is actually and a case of shells. There's two bedroom suites, a dining suite, and seven Venetian blinds. And this is in direct contrast to the, um, the listing of the theatre plant and equipment for the theatre he owned in Tweed Head, where the item that is the highest value item are the gamut British bioscopes with complete talkie equipment. There's two of those at £300 each. So gives you an idea of how much it would cost to run a theatre in those days. So questions get asked. Explain absence of general household furniture and effects other than the odd few items valued 19 pounds, five shillings herein. Explain absence of deceased personal's effects and also to name the tenants and the exact amount they paid. So the answer comes back from the solicitor. The deceased was not possessed of any household furniture and effects other than those disclosed in Schedule 5 to the stamp duties affidavit. All other items of furniture, including a wireless receiving set, pianola, crockery and china, are the property of the deceased's widow and were purchased by her out of the proceeds of the sale of certain freehold properties, which formed part of her separate estate. So that's important. He didn't just give them to her just before he died because that would have also had to have been charged on. Also, I find rather interesting is that um, one of the properties that he has in Wharf Road, Tweed's Head, is tenanted by Pete Oswood, Osgood, who is the person who's actually doing the valuation. Is that a conflict of inf interest? Just some photos of some of the houses resumed by the Public Works Department to build various things, such as the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the Sydney Bottenham Railway sorry, Sydney, Sydenham Botany Railway Resumption. Unfortunately, it's quite likely these houses were all demolished, but they do give you a good idea of the variety of styles. Moving on to the Carolyn Simpson collection. Carolyn Simpson Library is a specialised library dedicated to the history of the home. Basically, it, collect, it supports and helps contextualise the Museums of History New South Wales, house museums and historic sites but it has information on a variety of things, linoleum samples, seed catalogues, soap recipes. And I'd really like to highlight two of the things that they have available today. It's obviously open to the public and the details are there. So the first is the trade catalogues. And these have been digitized and are available via their catalog. And you get some fantastic examples of the type of furniture that they might've been talking about in some of those deceased estate files. I particularly like the Beard Watson one where it actually lets you have four schemes based on how much you're willing to spend. And Caroline Simpson actually holds the Australia's largest collection of historic wallpapers. And quite a few of these have also been uh, digitized and are available to view from the website. Beautiful collection. We were lucky enough to go and see some of the originals a couple of weeks ago. So where are we? Basically, the State Archives collection is at the State Archives Reading Room, 161 O'Connell Street, Kingswood. Uh, email us on collections at nhnsw.au. Caroline Simpson Library is in 10 Macquarie Street, Sydney at the Mint. And email them on library at mhnsw.au. Now on this, the Museums of History website, you will also see subject guides to a lot of the subjects I've been talking about that'll go into greater depth than I have here today. And I would particularly like to thank the New South Wales Land Registry Services for allowing us to show Crown plans in this presentation. And now I'd like to hand over to Andrew. Morning, everybody. We're seeing that slide, are we? Excellent. Okay. Um, just before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge I'm also on 
Gadigal land as I present this. And um, yeah, we'll just get right into it. Um, our collections here at the State Library are a little bit different to what archives have, and we'll go through some of those now. Okay, our collection is primarily focused on material which documents New South Wales and Australia, its people, their voices, communities, cultures, and environment. The State Library collects and preserves materials and evidence relating to our place in the world and makes them accessible to everyone in New South Wales and beyond. Um, and while we, we may share some things in common with archives, what I'll go through today is just things that um, primarily are held here, things like subdivision plans, architectural plans, I'll briefly just go over the, the Halloran survey roughs, I give a quick overview of SANS directory, the HLRV, historical land record viewer, and then move to some of the published works that might help with your family, with your house history research. Um, I should probably add that a lot of the things we collect are, um, we collect a, a mixture of published and unpublished items. So anything published in the state of New South Wales is considered legal deposits. So we will get a copy of that. A lot of things like the subdivision plans, architectural plans and that are considered to be unpublished. And we obtain those through <clears throat> a variety of means such as bequests, donations, and sometimes even purchasing. Okay, into subdivision plans. Subdivision plans advertise land that is to be, funnily enough, subdivided and sold. As we go through them, we can see that they tell the story of Sydney suburbs, the expansion of the city, the changes in public transport around local towns and local attractions, and the history of the real estate market and home ownership in Sydney, well, in New South Wales. We have more than 35,000 subdivision plans in the collection, and they date back to the 1860s and go up to around the 1940s. These these plans have recently been all been, I'm pretty sure all of them are available through the catalogue as they've all been digitised and you can search for them there. Okay, we'll skip into this, the first picture of one. As I said, the sketches or the posters showing land to be subdivided are often born out of, they can range from surveyors rough drawings to elaborate posters like we have on the one on the right and they're produced by real estate agents. They were typically produced between the 1820s and the 1950s. Most of our 1860s subdivision plans were catalogued separately, while later ones are grouped with others from the same area. And there's three sequences. There's SP for Sydney and suburbs. The town plans come under, uh, have a prefix of TP, and the county maps have a prefix of CP. While we're looking at this, this We'll post for Maroubra. If anyone lives at Maroubra, they may recognise some of these streets. What we can see here is well, an artist's impression of the beach and the surrounds, also the bathing beauty over here. We can see that this particular sale was an auction sale of Crown Land. Um, it was held on 12th of January at 1918, precisely at three o'clock. It gives us the auctioneer name and their location. It also notes that unsold blocks won't be available after the auction sale. What we can, what else we can see here, down here on the little little key that shows us that the, the land for sale is shown in these green shaded areas. So these these white ones are already taken. Um, gives us street names, transport options on this street. Gives us the parish name, county name, and some other details that I can't quite read with my eyes. Um, and also down the left here, it gives us the prices for the blocks. Again, there's probably not enough defin definition in this slide to see what they are, but it, this, this is pretty tip pretty typical of the information that you'll get from a subdivision plan. Just to show you how these how they can be used to actually research um, areas, I'm just about to go through three um, subdivision plans for the Willara Point area. And again, this um, this map gives us the name of the estate, when the auction will be sold, the name of the suburb, gives us details of, of nearby landmarks in the good maps. This one's probably lacking a little bit of detail as far as that goes. Gives us the, the name of the surveyors down the bottom right-hand corner here. Obviously, it's a Torrens title sale. Um, this 
it was the biggest subdivision of this night. Well, our house was was the biggest subdivision in this particular this particular plan. Originally, this estate belonged to a what was called the Cooper Estate, and it was a property of a convict turned businessman, Daniel Cooper. As you can see here, Rain and Horner mentioned they were the. This is probably one of the biggest um, properties they managed at that time. It was bought up. This this property here was bought up by many by Thomas Longworth. He was a mine manager. He lived there until his death in 1927. Moving on to the plan for 1928, we can see there's a lot more detail in this map. This is this is done a year after Longworth's death. The the house and land were then put up for sale. And again, this map, like most of them, will show us the name of the solicitor, the real estate agent, when the auction was, and the location of it. With a little bit more detail around um, the other properties on the map here. And again, if we were to view this on the catalogue, we could pretty much read each of these names pretty well and know who they were. We can see here, here's Wallara House. We've got the stables here. The tramway down the bottom. It also mentions Cranbrook Sports of School Sports Ground is down here, and we've also got Rose Bay, Rose Bay Park, and Lady Mountains Beach. So there's a lot more detail in this sort of map. The papers at the time, the Herald particularly reported that this property had sold for fifty-seven thousand two hundred pound, and the owner, well, the new buyer, had not made up their property what they one made up them what, what they would do with the property. Can't imagine what they were thinking, because a year later, the property's been subdivided. As we can see here, it's now called now we have a Longworth Estate, and it was subdivided in 23 lots. As part of this new subdivision, we've got a new road. And we've also seen the, the mention of Point Piper in on the map here as well. So, One thing, and again, I don't know that this is going to come through in detail on this map. Some of the maps that we have are, um, we may have more than one copy of the same map. Some of them will be um, clean maps, so no, no markings on them all. Some will be actually working copies that the estate agent used. And you may be able to vaguely see here, there's been some annotations made on these sites, mentioning that that, and that, that indicates that they were sold during those sales. I'll also point out here, when you search for these things on the catalog, the best way to do this would just be to pop in your um, suburb name, say whether it be Wallara or Granville, and use the keyword subdivision plans and possibly limit the format to map. You'll then, you'll then be able to view the map. You can actually download high-res copies from the catalog, which you can then use as you please, as long as you acknowledge the state library as the owner. And again, just to show that not everything's about Sydney, here's uh, the Coldale Township. Again, showing the, the lots that are for sale. One, well, it's interesting to me anyway, that this main, main South Coast Road, obviously we all know now that is Lawrence Hargrave Drive. Um, one another interesting thing about this little map is it shows you a location sketch of where it is in the broader scheme of near South Wales, I guess. And again, all the digitized maps are now out of copyright. They're available, for, they're free to share and use as long as you acknowledge the state library as the source. Also, I mentioned that th this is one of those collections that have been built up by acquiring things through various means. We, we, they may have been purchased, they may have been donated. They're very ephemeral sort of um, items. They weren't really meant to be kept. Um, so that's why they're all digitized and now available through the catalog. All right, moving on. Architectural plans. <laughs> Now, we own, I well, possess over 110,000 architectural plans that date back to the early 19th century up to the present day. The collection includes material from architects such as Blackett, John Berg, Arthur Balbinson, Sidney Ancher, 
Jorn Utzen and Glenn Merkert. It was while well, I was researching this, was actually a particularly interesting sketch that Utzen had done on a block of or a residence that he wanted to build on the northern suburbs of Sydney. Obviously, when he was planning to stay on a bit longer, but of course, as we know, that that wasn't actually completed. Um, architectural plans are actually as considered an unpublished work, so they can only be viewed in the Mitchell Library reading room. If you do go through these and find that there's something that's of your interest, because obviously we're not all living in architecture design houses, if you find something that you think may benefit your house research, do, please do an Ask a Librarian request, because there's, sometimes there can be restrictions on these collections. And we wouldn't want you to come in and have to be turned away. Um, it's worth noticing also that, again, sometimes the style of these architects can influence the broader trends in society at that time. So while your house may not be featured in one of these, if you can find one of, the, of a particular era or a particular style, it might be worth coming in and having a look at through some of those. Okay, quickly bouncing through to oh, I should also mention there's a there's a guide in the Mitchell Library that actually um provides a useful overview of the holdings. You can come in and go through that and see if there's anything there that may be of use to you. Moving on to a manuscript item, I think. Yes, here we are. Um, this is an example of a cute little notebook that was found um, in Metagong Tip, Metagong Tip back in 1984. Um, when it was found, it was quite dirty. It was in, it's actually incomplete. But this tells a story of, um, of Carl and Gertrude Moore uh, during their house hunting time in 1913. They were looking for um, a block of land to, to build a house, and they eventually settled on one in Hurstville. The entries in this diary begin on the 18th of January, and they eventually purchase a block in Hurstville, as I said, on the corner of Belmore Road and Stanley Road, which we now know Belmore Road is now King George's Road, and, a, and Stanley Road is now known as Australia Street. It's quite a detailed little diary. It goes through the expenses occurred in the purchase of the land, the construction of the cutting, in, including the tram fares and garden tools that were that we used during the process of building. As I said, the mention the, the notebook includes details of clearing of the land in preparation to build how they chose the house design, how they found a builder, the materials they wish to use, and so on and so on. This, um, this, ent this entire diary has been digitized and it is, av is available for viewing on our catalog. You can probably search for it using the call number MLM SS4242. I actually went down and had a look at it the other day. It's really, it's it's no, it's not really bigger than a birthday card in size, and it's quite delicate. But it's and it's still a bit grubby, to be honest. But it is, it's a fascinating little thing. And um, for those of you who are writing a house history or doing something similar, this might inspire you to, um, when you're finished doing the history, you may think that you might want to donate that history to the state library, and then we can put that into our collection for others to use in the future. Um, right, the other thing, again, I've, as Jennifer did before for, for that other house that she was looking at, here's um, what the site looks like today. I'm pretty sure the trolleys didn't belong to the Moors, but you never know. Um, what actually happened was they, although they, it's, it's quite a romantic tale, they built, they've, this, they chose this block of land, they just chose the house, they built the garden with plum trees and roses and, all, and what sorts of thing. And then they sold it seven years later, as it turned out. And as they sold it, they divided the property up and moved to another, and probably used the proceeds from that, to move to another residence on Carlton Road in Carlton. Um, 
And just to the right here is the subdivision map. If you can see that little that big black arrow there, that shows it, well, it wasn't part of this sale specifically. It does show where the site was at that time. I believe this was a, a sort of a, a site that was left over and they thought, well, let's just grab that one. I'll quickly bounce onto the Halloran survey roughs. Now, this is a collection of hand-drawn survey plans. It covers Sydney and suburbs and some regional centres. They come from the collection of Henry F. Halloran. He was a surveyor, real estate agent, and town planner. Bit of a triple threat. And they cover the years from 1880 to 1925, with most of these survey plans dating from back to around before 1910. Now, they're, they're quite, it's quite a large collection. They're arranged into 60 sequences by name of suburbs, towns, and also Sydney City Council wards, as they were at the time. Each of these items had a content, contents list, which you can find on the catalogue. So the quickest way to find these is to just probably just use the phrase Halloran Survey Roughs and the name of your suburb, or maybe even just Halloran and the name of your suburb, pop that in the catalogue. Within that catalogue record is a item list of what streets and locations are contained within that packet. You can go through that and see if there's anything relevant to you. Now, uh, these things were done on a variety of, of, of um, pieces of paper, the back of receipts on tracing paper. So they are quite delicate. And of course, they were probably the precursor to subdivision plans that he later produced. So they're quite very delicate. They weren't meant to last, meant to last long. Um, but unfortunately, they're not, they're not digitized as yet. If you do want to look at them, I suggest you put in an Ask a Librarian request because they're, they we will need to conduct a supervised viewing if you wanted to see anything from that collection. Moving on to sand. Um, while this is not unique to us, we do hold hard copies of um, of sand in um, in the Mitchell collection. But we, if you were to come in and ask them, we probably would not. They probably wouldn't really want to issue them to you. But what they were was a street and commercial directory published by the Sands Company that ran between 1858 up to 1933. The way that they went around devising these, or producing these things, was the sales reps would literally go door to door around all the cities and houses, talking to the occupants, getting their details, um, and then including that in direct in the directory. So the picture of the one we have up here is for 1858 to 1859. It's likely that a lot of the entries in this in that directory were um, compiled in 1857. So that's probably one thing to remember. Um, the, the, it did change. It, the title changed over the years, but it's generally first two two sands. Um, Well, it's very useful to find to actually tracking houses and particularly house names at the time. The names and directory aren't always the, the owners of the house. So that that's probably something to remember. And often the street numbers have changed as have the street names. Um, as I said, we hold hard copies in, in, in Mitchell Reading Room. We also have this on microfiche in the family history section on lower ground two in the Marie Bashir Reading Room. One way that you can access them at home, though, is just to go into the City of Sydney archive site, um, or they can be searched on Ancestry. There's also another similar post office directory that called Wises, which ran to 1950. It's got a bit more of a broad scope, broad scope, and that can be found on Trove. All right. HLFA, Historical Land Records Viewer, which we all love so much. Um, I'm obviously not going to go into any great detail about how to how to use HLRV. It's quite, um, can be quite complex to search and find things on here. But I will mention that we have, on our website, we have four um, webinars, each ranging about half an hour long. They'll go through the introduction to HLRV, which give you an overview on how to use it, pretty much how to use the torrent, how to search for torrent, torrent title records, go through old land grants and old system titles. And there's also a case study 
at the end of that as well. And just out of interest, these these titles here I've got were for the the Hertzville House of the Moors. It shows when they purchased it, and also this is the um the details from the sale in 1930. Okay. The other thing we you might find useful coming in here is the publisher works that we have. There's just a list of some of the ones that will help you, that may help you with your house history research. They can be used to um, identify architectural styles, um, materials used, all that sort of thing. Okay, there's an example of, of um, Applebee's identifying Australian architecture. As you can see from the entry, it, these entries, it gives you a little key guide on what these features of all the houses are referred to, the background of the of the style, et cetera, et cetera. We also have the ABC Guide to Sydney Suburbs. That's an interesting thing, published in 1917, where people could choose a suburb they wanted to live at. It would tell them how much railway tickets cost, what the loan rates were from each council, and a little sales guide to various home and land packages that could have been purchased at the time. There's also a, a little floor plan here for, for um, residential flats in North Sydney. Pretty random. Okay, we also have journals or serials, whatever you want to call them in our collection here. Now, the ones I've listed up here, you can use to, um, they're all available on Trove, I should mention. Um, you can use those to add a bit of colour to your research. Some of them will have um, lists of uh, building projects that are underway. You may find something searching through those about your about your house. Um, but again, any anything after 1955, we you'll have to come in if you want to actually have a look at those. They'll be you can come in the Macquarie Street Wing to view those. But anything pre 55 will be on trove. Um, just before we run out of time, I'll get to the local collections that we have. These are, these are just a few little pictures I took of photos of, of um, heritage studies in my local library that the councils had in their local study section. Um, they include heritage assessments and studies commissioned by councils, often publications by local historical societies. And if they are at your local library, we probably have them here as they would have been legal deposit items as well. Just over on the right, I'll just quickly show that this one actually had the address, a bit of detail about the history of the house, and also things like lot number, DP number, and vol fold details. That can be quite useful. Um, also, your local library, two came to mind. The Hillshire and Inner West have pretty good um, local study sites, which give you guides on how to research the history of your house. Um, Hillshire has their rate books digitized, I believe. You might want to check with those. I know there are some councils that do have rate notebook rate books digitized. Um, just sort of pop up a few links if people want to go through those. I mean, it's probably just as easy to Google those things rather than write down a whole URL. And I'll quickly get to the final slide because we're running out of time. Um, if you need to, if you need assistance from us about researching um, your house history, there's three ways to get us. There's the chat line, or you can call us on the phone. We can probably give you about ten minutes of assistance by either of those ways. Or if you want a bit more help, you can submit an Ask a Librarian request through the Ask Now page. That will we usually take about an, you do about an hour of research on your request from there. And I think we better finish up there because we're going a bit late. Okay.